All right. So again, welcome everyone. My name is Vanessa. I'm the writing coach here at the School of Social Work. I've been here um, coaching students on uh, writing for about 20 years, and I specialize in um, social science type writing, um, technical writing. Um, so any questions that you might have on anything that you're working on, discussion questions, narrative papers, I'm happy to um, assist you with that. And we'll go ahead and start. This is a way for you to contact me. So if you have any questions after today's presentation, you can feel free to give me a call, 577-4339, um, email at ac8153 at lean.edu. If you're interested in scheduling an appointment with me, you would do that through STARS. Um, and I will have a QR code at the end of this presentation as well that you can use that takes you directly to STARS. So as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna break this process down a little bit for you by defining APA, like why do we have to use this? Um, format, title page, citations. We're gonna like dive just a little bit into plagiarism, but not too, too much. Um, we're looking at the reference page, headings, and then inclusive language, which is a new feature, new-ish feature in APA 7. So this is the book that all of this information has been taken out of. It's the APA 7th edition that was released in October of 2019. This is a significant update for APA style. So if you are using the 6th edition, it isn't going to do you a ton of good. Um, this book is available at Purdy Kresge Library for you to take out if you are not able to purchase it. Amazon has them used. You can buy them anywhere from I think 15, as low as 15. And then I think it goes up to 35 new, 40 maybe new. Um, so feel free to pick up a copy. The APA website also has a lot of information. It's not everything that's in the book, um, but it has a good amount of information as well. So why do we have to use this? Um, part of it is because we are social science and it is sort of a, expected standard across the board. Um, so like U of M School of Social Work uses it, Oakland School of Social Work uses it. So it's the standard. It allows readers to cross reference sources easily. It gives you credibility as a writer when you use it properly. It also helps protect you from plagiarism when you're using it properly. And often it provides clarity to papers specifically with the language you're using, as well as the headings and just the way the paper's organized, it helps the reader kind of navigate their way through the paper. So you can find APA 7 in lots of places, um, not necessarily all coming out of the book, but um, I can certainly assist you with it. Um, there is a study guide through Pretty Kresge Library. You can also check out the book from Pretty Kresge Library the website apastyle.apa.org, which is published by the American Psychological Association. That's a great website. It's updated daily. And the nice thing about this website is when it's showing you examples of things like citations and references, it gives you a corresponding chapter in the manual. So you can then go to the manual and look there as well. OWL is still a really great website, um, owl.english.purdue.edu, that um, also is updated regularly. I find that website to be a little too busy for my personal taste. The cleaner APA style website is more like my uh, jam. So basic formatting checklists. So this is just things that you want to make sure you're doing for every paper you're submitting. Um, double spacing your paper throughout, one inch margins on all sides, a complete title and reference page. Um, APA 7 allows for more uh, fonts now. So 11 point Calibri is allowed, 11 point Arial. 
and 12 point Times New Roman. Those are the three most popular fonts we see students using. Those are all acceptable now in APA 7. Students no longer have to include a running head, um, so that is no longer part of the checklist. But if you are submitting something for publication, that would now still require a running head. We want our appendices all clearly labeled if we're using them, citing properly throughout, the use of quotation marks when using verbatim text. So when we're writing something and using quotes word for word, we have to include the citation as well as the quotation marks. And another update is instead of two spaces after a period, it's one space after a period. Um, so this is just basic. And again, each paper might have different guidelines, different requirements. Um, you always want to listen to your instructor and hear what their requirements are. They will always trump what's in the APA manual if they're looking for additional information on a title page. I had an instructor last semester just for, um, to save space, wanted students to write their papers in single space. So students did that. That's not going to be the standard in APA, but that's what the instructor is requiring. So always listen to your instructor, always follow your instructor's guidelines. If you're writing a paper that will require appendices and figures, this would be the order of pages. MSW students tend to write papers that might require more of these elements, like the abstract. Um, so the order would be title page, abstract, body, reference page, and then your tables, figures, and appendices. And again, the book does a really great job explaining all of this in detail if this is something that you need to do for an assignment. This is a sample of a student title page. So what you might hear is that we're no longer using the running head, but we're still identifying the title page as page one. So that's still there. Our title is now in bold and we have an extra space now between our title and our name. So we have a title, extra space, then name, our school affiliation, so school of social work, Wayne State University, our course, so it's social work 3010, 3030, 4710, whatever it might be, our instructor's name, and then the date the paper is due. And again, your instructor may want additional information, um, and they will usually communicate that to you. But this is the order that the information um, goes on the title page, and this is the way it's formatted. Again, this is all in the manual. Um, I believe it is in the first couple of chapters in the book. I have it with me here. But um, you can see this example in the APA manual. So a question students often ask me is, when should I cite? Um, I think students are sometimes looking for me to say something like, you want to cite every three sentences or every four sentences at a citation. And that's unfortunately not how it works. It is a little more vague than that. Um, we want to cite anytime we summarize facts and ideas from a source, anytime we're paraphrasing from a source, and particularly when we're quoting verbatim text from an author. So you will be citing frequently. It's an, you want to not be so afraid to cite frequently. Um, Many students will undersite, um, and I will see more instructors taking points off than oversighting. So if you're sure at this point, cite, and then typically an instructor will say, you don't need so many citations here, um, and you typically won't see instructors take points off for oversighting. Um, you, in particular, want to cite as soon as you use a direct quote. And when you're summarizing or paraphrasing, Typically, you'll want to cite when you've completed that summary or completed that paraphrase. Um, so that could average out to three to four citations per paragraph, again, depending on the length of the paragraph. Um, this is also a point where I want to mention that many students overuse the use of quotations in papers. Quoting doesn't demonstrate learning as much as paraphrasing does. Paraphrasing is your 
interpretation of the material, how you're applying the literature um, to your paper. And that is where you demonstrate the most learning. Like I have read this literature, I have synthesized the literature, and now I'm able to apply it to my paper. That shows that you've learned. Whereas lifting a quote and dropping it into a paper, not as much. But quotes do have a time and a place. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. This table is taken out of chapter eight of the APA seven manual. I like it because it's just a very easy table to read. It just shows you the basic citation styles. So you want to consult chapter eight when you're doing this at home um, or wherever you're writing your papers. But typical citation style is called the author year citation style. So we're using the author's surname as well as the year it was published, the publication was published. So if we have one author, um, we want to use the surname and the year. Two authors require both surnames and the year. And then when you are three or more authors, we use et al, which is Latin for and others. It's like a abbreviation for uh, Latin and others. And that just shows we have other authors, but we're not including them in the citation. And that's really to save space. And because we do mention those authors in the reference page. So there's no need to list like six authors in your paper. Um, sometimes we don't have authors, but we may have an organization or group um, that published information. And then we would just use that institution's title. So the National Institute of Mental Health, Stanford University, Wayne State University. Um, I just had a student um, cite something from the Detroit Historical Society. So sometimes your author will be an organization. I also want to note in this slide as well that um, we both have a parenthetical style citation as well as a narrative style citation. The parenthetical style citations look like they do here in the table and they are located always at the end of a sentence. The narrative citations look like they do here in the column in the table and those are usually located at the beginning of a sentence and we'll show you how those look integrated into sentences coming up here. So I have both of those examples here um, listed in number one and number two. Um, I have included page numbers here because I'm illustrating direct quotes. Direct quotes require the use of a page or paragraph number. So example one is a narrative citation where you are referring to the author at the beginning of the sentence, stating our direct quote, and then we're ending with our page number and then ending with a period. The second example um, here, so go to the here, okay. My second example shows the quote starting here. And then here at the end, we have a parenthetical citation with our author's surname, the year it was published, and then the page number. Um, so in this case, the student used both the quotation marks as well as the citation. You are required to do that as well. These are examples of paraphrased ideas. So again, a student has taken information from literature and then interpreted that information. Um, same style. The first example is narrative. Start with the beginning of this, the year and then go into our interpreted idea. In this case, I didn't add the page number at the end because it is not required for paraphrased um, content. Although it is something that you could add if you wanted to, if it would be helpful for the reader to know what page you pulled it from, but it is not required the way that it is when you're directly quoting material. And again, chapter eight in the manual goes very deep into a lot of this information as well as examples. I'm giving you really the basics to get you comfortable with it. Um, and then if you have, again, further questions, you can always reach out to me. 
Sometimes we don't have all the information that might be required for a citation. So you have to kind of make do with what you have. Um, if a citation or a piece of literature doesn't have an author, there is no group author or no date, um, they encourage you to use the title. And you can put that in quotes. And then the ND indicates no date. I don't have one. So instead of leaving it blank, we add the ND for no date. Um, if we have two or more works within the same parentheses, so let's say I have used two pieces of literature from two different authors to synthesize an idea and paraphrase it into my paper, and I want to cite them in one place, you can do that. Here, we have a parenthetical citation, and I have separated the authors with these semicolons. So that's how you would handle that. Again, anything with three or more authors, you will use the et al, which is lowercase et space al period, specific parts of a source. So we talked about adding the page number and paragraph number. You are also free to use a chapter or table as well. If you don't have a page number, you don't have a paragraph number. So there's a little more freedom here. Um, to use table or chapter than there was in APA 6. We didn't see that as often. Um, so it is important, again, to identify where exactly we retrieved the information. So you're giving the reader a path back to the material. Sometimes students uh, want to cite a communication. So that could be anything from an email to a TED talk that you went to hear. Um, a, you went to hear someone speak as part of like a classroom trip. So lots of different circumstances. Those are all considered personal communications. Um, and those would be cited this way. And these are interesting because these require you to use the initial of the individual, the surname, and then indicate that it was a personal communication between you and someone, and then the date in which the communication occurred. If there is no record of the communication anywhere, like we can't find it somewhere, then we don't put it in the reference page because it's not recoverable data. We can't um, find this information somewhere. Um, someone asked a question about whether this would be available. I can send the PowerPoint to you. It will also be available on YouTube as well on the School of Social Works YouTube page. I believe there's an older version of this on that already, but I can also send you um, the PowerPoint as well. Actually, if you email me, I can send it to you because um, I don't think I have everybody's email address here. Long quotes. So this is a little challenging sometimes with students. They like using very long quotes in papers, sometimes because it takes up a lot of room um, and then they have to write less. Um, but really this is frowned upon. We wanna stay away from using longer direct quotes. Long quotes are any quotes that are 40 words or more. And these, when used, we have to block them. So we're indenting them from the left margin and then again, still citing them. But if you can paraphrase a quote this long, please do so because in a five to seven page paper, a quote this long takes up really critical space where you could be demonstrating what you know to your instructor rather than filling it with a really long quote. If you need help with this, with paraphrasing, you can feel free to reach out to me and I work with students on paraphrasing. Um, and also be mindful that some instructors limit the amount of quotes that students can use in papers. They'll say like no more than two, or I wanna see just paraphrasing. So be mindful of that as well. So a reference page is always going to be in alphabetical order. And we always use hanging indents for 
um, them as well to make them a little bit easier to read. They are required in APA papers. They are always going to include a list of every recoverable source that a student makes reference to in an essay. Um, they provide all the information that's necessary for a reader to locate the information. So all the authors, the publisher, the date, the title, the link. So all that information's there. And each retrievable source in an essay must appear on the reference page and vice versa, with the exception of something like um, a personal communication, which may not be recoverable. It's not available like via Google or any databases. This is an example of how to format a reference page. So as you can see here at the top, we have our page number. Um, we have bolded our references header. And then we see that this is in alphabetical order. Um, the hanging indentation can be seen right here. So we are not indenting this first line, but we're indenting the subsequent lines here. Um, so be mindful of, of what a hanging indentation is. Um, this first reference is a book, and we know that because we have a book title and no um, additional information about a journal title. The second one is more of a new press release. And the, oops, and the third one is an actual journal article. So we have the journal title, the I'm sorry, the article title, the journal in which it came from, the volume and issue number, and then the page range, and then the link. So everything the reader might need to retrieve that source is here in the reference page. And that's why the citations are so much more simplified because we don't need all of this in there. These are some other examples of um, journal articles. This is a journal article with one author. So again, we have the author name, the title of the article, the title of the journal, volume, issue number, page range. This indicates that this is a hard copy journal because we don't have a link right here to the actual article. So sometimes students prefer going to the library, pulling the physical article out and reading it and citing it that way. Some prefer pulling the digital copy, whatever works for you is fine. And there are examples in the APA book to really meet all of your needs. Um, this particular newspaper article doesn't have an author. So in place of that, we've used the title and then the date that it appeared in the newspaper and then the page. And again, this illustrates a hard copy newspaper rather than an online paper because we don't have an actual link to the newspaper. I'm going to stay away from primary and secondary sources for now. Um, often, but not, not every student, but many students have to write a annotated bibliography. Um, and really an annotated bibliography is a reference page that contains a list of references and then typically a summary of each of those articles or books or whatever you happen to have. Sometimes an instructor will have specific questions that they want you to answer about um, each reference. Sometimes they're looking for a, like a paragraph summary. They will communicate that to you. And I'll show you an example of an annotated bibliography in the next um, slide over. But a reference list will always contain every resource cited in the text of your paper. They are alphabetical. Bibliographies can tend to include not only the resources that you use, but also resources you may have consulted, but not used um, and not cited necessarily. And some could be organized chronologically by subject or alphabetically. In this case, if you have an annotated bibliography, you would alphabetically organize it the way you would an APA um, reference page. And you can look in more depth in chapter nine, but I wanted to give you an example here of 
what an annotated bibliography looks like, how you would format it. So you would have a full title of that annotated bib, the reference entry, and then whatever paragraph your instructor has asked you to write. Again, it could be a summary, you could be answering specific questions, they will communicate that information to you. So headings, I think, are probably behind citing the second most important part of a paper because it helps keep you organized as a student as you're writing the paper. It also helps keep the reader organized as well. So headings help keep a reader um, easily kind of oriented throughout the paper. They establish a hierarchy and transitions are a little clearer um, when we use headings. The book again, does a really nice job of illustrating the use of headings. Um, and the way APA does them now in, in the APA 7 is level one, which is your main heading. It's typically very broad. It introduces the reader to a new topic. Those headings will be centered and bold and use title case. Um, if you would like to go into more detail um, and break up a, a, a section further, you could also use subheadings, which students often use. Those often sit on the left margin and are bold and use title case. Anything beyond this, I don't see as often anymore. And if you feel like you've been instructed to use these or want more information on them, I'm happy to go through them with you, but in general, you will be using level one and level two the most often. This is how headings are used in example. So here is your broad center heading, and this is introducing the reader to a new topic. And then this writer wants to break down the topic a little bit further. So they've added a subheading here, and that is sitting on the left margin. And then we start our new paragraph right there. So once you get the hang of using these, it really helps you as a writer keep your information organized. Um, and then the reader has, I think, I think the best of it because they know exactly what you're talking about, what you're about to talk about. Um, and then they break down the topic even further for you. So that's why I like them. If your instructor says use APA 7, that includes the headings. Okay, Access accessibility, inclusive language, okay. So in APA 6, they didn't talk as much about using bias-free language. It really was not highlighted that much in that manual. Um, in, chap in the seventh edition, they have dedicated an entire chapter to it. So all of chapter five is devoted to discussing bias-free language guidelines. And that really includes how we discuss our clients, our populations, how do we refer to them? Um, and it's really important that we get this right when we're writing because you know inaccurate, unclear writing often leads to misunderstandings and errors. Your instructors may not fully understand what you're trying to communicate. Um, and we want to avoid that. And this has to stay with you as you leave Wayne State and go into practice. Um, you know, particularly if you're working in a school and you're a school social worker, you know, my, my son um, does get social work services. It's really important that that social worker is very clear in how to discuss my son. Um, so always choose words that are accurate, clear, free from bias. Um, so here are some examples here. And all of this is directly out of the book. You can go right in there and read more about it because there's a lot more in there on this um, bias-free language. So it's broken up um, into sections with disability on page 137. Um, APA is saying instead of using adjectives as nouns to label groups of people, descriptive phrases are preferred. So instead of labeling autistic children, we would say these are children who have an autism diagnosis or have been diagnosed with autism. 
Second example, an epileptic. We are talking about a youth or uh, a male with epilepsy or who has an epilepsy diagnosis. So we're defining people by who they are and not by their diagnoses. Um, also age. So it's, well, it's, this is really common in journal articles and older journal articles to see um, the phrase senior citizens, the aged elderly people, that is no longer preferred. So now it is older persons, older adults, and also labeling the age range. So older adults between the ages of 65 and 75 or 65 and 85. Um, the more specific we can get about, about our population, the better it is for the reader and the less room there is for misunderstandings. Racial and ethnic identity. Um, and I also want to preface this on page 142. They say that the terms used to refer ethnic groups continue to evolve over time. So while this is true today in this edition, in six months, they may come out with, um, you know, different guidelines and we have to follow those. So it's always important to stay on top of what they're saying um, because it does evolve and change. So to refer to non-white racial and ethnic groups, collectively used terms such as avoiding minorities and then underrepresented groups <clears throat> and people of color. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, so again, for additional information, please see chapter five of um, the AP manual. This is a really valuable chapter. I encourage all of my students to read it because it really does change their writing. Um, so that's it for APA. Does anybody have any questions for me right now? I have a question. Yes. Okay, like if you're doing a PowerPoint, how would you transfer that information? Do you still have to paraphrase your PowerPoint or do you copy paste and then put your references under, you know, your information on the PowerPoint? Oh, if you're doing a PowerPoint, not if you are, are you using a PowerPoint, like information from a PowerPoint in your paper or are you writing a PowerPoint? I'm writing a PowerPoint, doing a presentation. So you would want to manage it kind of the same way. Like if you're using a direct quote, you want that citation to be sitting right there. If you are paraphrasing, you want to ensure that there is a citation there when you have completed that paraphrase or that summary. And then typically I do advise students to add a reference page at the end of their PowerPoint so the instructor can see where they've retrieved their literature. So I would treat it the same way, even though you're using bullets, maybe instead of paragraphs, um, you still need to give credit to the original author and their intellectual property. So that stays the same. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Hi, Vanessa, it's Tam. Hi, welcome. Hi, I, I thought, so I like to join this, it's always a good refresher, but also um, I'm a faculty member at the school. And so if, I, I, I would say I join because sometimes students have questions like the, uh, how will a professor look at something and that kind of thing, right. um, or what is the most important of all this stuff to do? So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to also I've worked with Vanessa many years on this work. <laughs> I was telling them, and I don't know if you were. I was here for most of it. Session when I was saying this. Um, but headings, I think sometimes students forget to use them because when instructors say use APA, they, they don't think about those as much as they think about the citing and the, and the reference and the mm -hmm. title page. So. I just want to emphasize that headings are part of that and they're important because they help you and they also help the reader. So I just want to emphasize that again. So Vanessa, can I have five minutes? Yeah. Um, all right. Will you start at the beginning and I'll tell everyone on this call and like what I think is important, my perspective as a faculty member. Yeah. So, cause it's a lot of detail. I also understand 
It's a lot of detail. So this would be my breakdown. I love that she does all the slides. I think you could buy the book, but I also think you could take two or three main slides that I will point out to you here. And if you do that, you'll be pretty close. So yes, you can buy, buy the book, but so next slide. Um, the one, I think you explained very well why APA. The way I explain it to students is don't fight it. The, the profession of social work, the whole profession is on board with APA. So if you want to, you know, dialogue with fellow practitioners across Michigan, across the United States, we're on board with APA. So that, that would be sort of why our whole profession is really using most of the if not all of the social work journals use APA. And the other thing I would encourage you, once you get it, it's not going to change. It's just something you learn, like tying your shoes. Okay, next slide. So I wanted to go to the title page, wherever that is, and say, to me, it is very reasonable at a graduate student level to follow this template. And I would say this, it looks professional, but it also shows that you can follow a model, which I actually think is a skill to demonstrate. So, you know, capitalize when it needs to be capitalized and do the course number exactly like it. And it's actually, I spend hours with students, hours is a strong word, trying to say like, can you just follow this model? So I think if you start out, you have the title page right here. So take a screenshot of this. I think this will make your professor happy. All right, that would be slide one. I hope this is helpful to the students. Slide two, I like the idea of in-text citations. I'm gonna to go to the one that says narrative and parentheses. Uh -huh. Yes, I find students, I find this chart, the one before, the, the grid chart. Oh, sorry. Yeah, to be excellent and all you need, but I also see that it's confusing. So the way I explain it is if you are, using what we call a parenthetical citation, that is at the end of the sentence. That's how I describe it. And again, correct me, Vanessa, if I'm wrong. But it's, yeah, no, no, no. Parenthetical is just the end. So literally, I write in a big chart, that means the end. So you're yeah. putting it at the end, and then I would put a period after that parenthesis, right? Yeah. So it's like yeah. the end of the sentence. So yeah. right there. Narrative means you usually want to start your sentence and talk about these researchers. So if I use myself, I would say, Perry, parenthesis, open parenthesis, 2023, close parenthesis, suggest that. So sometimes I find that students don't know what to do next after they see the narrative citation. So what I would say is try these simple phrases, I'll type them in the chat or someone else can like, suggest that found that. So, so it kind of gives you more scientific way to say what happens afterwards. Um, so these are names of researchers and they found that, discovered that, suggest that. Um, so that's sort of how to use a narrative. So the other thing about these is this is a way to honor the researchers and respect that this is not your idea, that is their idea. So when I say, when people say, how, how, why should I, when do I cite? If it's your own ideas, you would not cite because the whole paper is your own idea. But if in the paper you are using someone else's idea, applying someone else's idea, you have to out of respect and to avoid plagiarism and all that show that this is not my idea. So that's how I talk about that. So when you say in-text citation, that also means within the body of the paper. So yep. all of these are both, right? I'm, I'm right, Vanessa. <laughs> okay. At the end of the paper, everything you've put in the body has to be listed. And that's mm -hmm. the, what is it called? The reference page? Yep. Mm -hmm. And then yes. there are just models. I guess if you, so I would learn this in text and then the last one would probably be the model one. Where you have the actual citations one? Um, there. Okay, there. Yeah, and I like this. According to, I also give that really easy. According to, name of researchers. Great. Yeah. Um, and then where's the references? Okay, so here. 
So for me, it matters where the commas are and the periods. It seems mm -hmm. very petty. It seems like, why would someone waste the time? But I would just say this, it looks professional and it's also saying I am professional enough to be with the social work profession in this. So what I point out is that you have the authors, they show you how to list it. The only, the first letter of the first word of the title of the article is capitalized. Only. So if you look, progressive is, but there's no muscle relaxation, all that is not. That's, if you can just work on that, like capitalize only, because the switch is for the actual journal where this article is found, all the major words are capitalized. General hospital psychiatry, right? That, and it also should be italicized. So capitalization and italics, and then the next one, which is the 16, is the volume italicized, yeah. but the issue number is not. I know it's petty, but but it's not that hard, it, especially with papers where you're only citing two to five things. Just double check it, double check it. And then the other last thing I always tell my students is if you go into Google Scholar and push cite, it gets you very, very close to this. Yeah. So then you just have to double check it. Those are all of my words of wisdom. I hope that's helpful, students. I think so. And it's not petty. I think sometimes what might happen is an instructor may not look at those things and the student becomes comfortable with that. And what I like to tell students is to not get comfortable with that, learn the right way to do it and just do it the right way every time. And then you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about whether you added the period mm -hmm. to this for mm -hmm. this class and not that class. Just mm -hmm. do it the right way from the get go. And then you don't have to worry about losing points. And this is for students too. This is like the last place you wanna lose points because this is the easiest place to keep them. So if you can just, like Dr. Perry said, follow the model, you know, periods, commas in the right place, capitalizations in the right place, you don't lose points here. And that's like an easy five to 10 points that you hang on to if you happen to be losing them somewhere else. So that's another way to think about it too. And then did you want me to keep going? I think heading? that was like my three major thing. I mean, I know how to do it now that I've shown you. you we'll go back to fundamentals, that, that one with, okay. So it's very clear, it didn't change. Even though the slide looks different, the capital F is only with fundamentals, but with the journal, it's journal, small o of, Comparative, big C, you see, so it's not changing. Once you know it, you realize, oh, this doesn't change that much in, in effect at all. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say is like, for me, those are the three things. I hope that's helpful students. Um, and again, faculty want you to develop ways to express your ideas. And what happens is students write papers, sometimes they're so worried about oversighting, there's so much and you don't know where your own voice is, uh, the student's voice is. And then the other thing is being very clear, which is someone else's thought and which is your thought. And it's, I think if you kind of follow these models, it's much clearer for a reader to understand, oh, that's, that's amazing. That, that student has this incredible idea that's that's not, they're not citing it. Wow, that's very original. So again, you're trying to make sure that you're spending a lot on graduate education, that you're trying to push your own thinking on these important issues. So I hope that's helpful. Super helpful. Um, go back. Is that it? Nicholson Ridge. Okay. The end of the go back, if I can discard. I just wanted students, I wanted to give them my QR code in case they need to reach out to me. So I'm just going to go there now. Um, so, students, if you need to reach out, um, STARS is where you would schedule an appointment. The QR code takes you right to my STARS page. Um, and then if you need to reach me via email. Um, this is my email address, ac8153 at weed.edu. Does anybody else 
have anything they want to add or any more questions maybe on a paper you're working on right now? Okay. Well, I thank you very much for joining me today. Um, stay tuned in a couple of weeks. We'll be looking at um, using library resources and we'll have Monique Oldfield here. Um, it'll be a Thursday afternoon again um, in two weeks. I think it's February 8th. Um, she'll be with me at 3.30. So if you are using the library website this semester or had some issues with it last semester and you know you'll be using it again, come back because Monique will be here to walk you through um, finding digital sources using the library website. So um, I'm excited to have her join me for that. So, um, and if you have any questions that you don't wanna share here, but wanna ask me, please feel free to email me um, at your convenience. And thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Perry, Barbara Hughes, um, and Tom today for joining me.